for now, all the scripts and the functions that we have been writing so far are quite simple. Basically, a concatenation of commands that you might have typed in the command window. But uh, the MATLAB is actually a full-featured programming language that actually allows you to build uh, lots of very sophisticated logic, lo loops, branches, that kind of thing, into either your script or functions. So we can we can do the f rest of the exams, uh, do the rest of the exercises either using scripts or using functions. But I want to show you some of the intermediate results. So I'm gonna just uh, use scripts. So if I go I'm gonna write a new script, I can just click on this plus sign. It's gonna open a new window. And let's let's try something. Let's try something. Let's try something. I'm gonna define a variable t, but instead of a sort of assign a specified value to it in the script. I'm going to ask the user to enter a input, enter a number. Here I have used a command called input, which I haven't talked about in my previous videos. So the input function allows you to gather input from the user, from the keyboard actually. So it's actually displaying this comment, this particular uh, prompt in the command line and is asking the user to enter a number so 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 here I actually can get I can get the I can get a number get a number from the from the user by using this kind of a so whatever number that user types on the keyboard is going to go into this container t this number this variable t and then I'm going to do some sort of a testing so the basic structure is called if and as soon as you type if, you can sort of see it has a blue color. It means that it's a MATLAB keyword. And then I'm going to test if, see if t is larger than 2.56. If it is true, if this condition is actually true, I'm going to display very significant. So disp is another command that we haven't talked about so far. So all those commands are actually MATLAB commands. So if you want to know more about those things, you can type, for example, help input. And then it's going to explain what the input command is actually uh, used for. It's an input prompt for user input. So you can give a prompt. And then whatever user types in the terminal, or in the command window, is going to go into the output of this input command. command. And then disp is just for you, for for you to display. It's just for you to display some text, for example. Display array, and the array that you can sort of use can be numbers or just text strings. Here I'm just displaying a text string. So if this condition is true, it's going to display very significant. But if it's not true, suppose it's false. T is smaller than 2.56, smaller than or equal to 2.56. What's going to happen, right? So you have another keyword that's called else if, else followed by if without any space between them. So, so, so this is also a keyword, and and you can sort of see it's um it, it's uh, it's in color, it's in blue, so it's a keyword. Oh, else if else if is one of the keyword that's gonna cover cover some of the situations that's not covered by this particular condition. So if this condition is false then MATLAB is going to skip this particular command and then come down to look at the condition on after the if command. So suppose I do t smaller than 1.96. So if this condition actually is true, then MATLAB is going to run this command, that's the disp command, and then jump directly to the end of the if structure. We haven't specified where the end actually is for now, but we are going to sort of specify that later on. But if this condition is actually false, then MATLAB is going to look at this condition and see if this condition is true or false. So if t is larger than 2.56, it's going to display very significant. And if it's false, which means t is smaller than or equal to 2.56, and then it's going to look at this particular condition. Is t going to be smaller than 1.96? If it's true, if it is true, then it's going to display insignificant. But if it's going to be false again, which means that t is smaller than or equal to 2.56, and the t is also smaller than 
and at this point, at this point, you can sort of still use more ELSIF to cover more sort of situations. If you are done with specifying the situations, you can use the keyword else. Else means that it's going to cover all the rest of the situations that's not covered by this if, that's not covered by this else if, and it's all the rest of the situations. If if that's what you want to do, uh, you can sort of disp significant, for example. And then you end this particular if structure with the keyword end. And then that's how you actually use a, can, can do a, can do a branching structure, can do a branching structure. So, so the logic is kind of slightly more complicated for this particular example. So it's, MATLAB is going to look at this condition see if it's true. If it's true, then it's going to execute this one and then directly come to end. If it's false, MATLAB is going to look at this condition first. If this is true, then it's going to display this one. But if this is also false, then it's going to look for further else if conditions. If it doesn't exist, it's just going to jump direct to else and, and display this one. So let's let's try to save it. Let's try to save it. And we are going to call it script 4. And then let's just run it. Enter a number. I'm going to enter so I get a random number. It's telling me very significant. 59 is definitely larger than 2.56. So it's um, uh, if you run it again, minus 10. That's a, it's a very small number, right? It totally doesn't make any sense, actually. So, but but it's actually displaying insignificant because it's smaller than 1.96. It's actually coming down to this um, particular line, actually. So if I put a 59, 59 is larger than 2.56. So so this condition becomes true. It's going to display this line. It's going to run this line. Display very significant. And minus 10 is like a so this condition is going to be false because the minus 10 is not larger than 2.56. So it's going to look at this this line. And minus 10 is smaller than 1.96. So this condition becomes true. So it's displaying uh, insignificant. So it's running this line. Right. And uh, but I suppose I give it some 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 kind of weird number. Let's let's give it some weird number. That's uh, uh, let's give it two. Let's give it a 2. So 2 is not larger than 2.56. So this condition is false. So it's going to jump through this line. It's not going to sort of run this line. And then it's going to look at this this line. Is it going to be smaller than 1.96? 2 is not smaller than 1.96. So this condition is also false. So finally, it's going to come down to this else. It's going to execute this particular command. So it's going to display insignificant. So, so that's how branching actually works. So now let's look at the, some slightly more complicated uh, branching statements with two conditions concatenating together. So let me comment out of this block. I'm going to sort of right click and then choose comment. So everything in this uh, selection is going to be commented out. I'm going to write some, some new examples. So I'm going to do like two numbers. ii equals to 6 and then JJ is going to equal to 21, so just some random uh, integers. The reason I'm not using a single i or a single j is to reduce confusion, because MATLAB actually uses small i and small j to indicate uh, the unit of the imaginary numbers. So you can still use i as a variable, but uh, it may have some confusions if you are actually working on complex, complex, complex numbers. And uh, I'm using 2i just to reduce that kind of confusion. Um, so let's let's try some test. So if i i larger than five, I'm gonna do k k equals to i i. Uh, k k is not gonna be k is not gonna be used by MATLAB as an imaginary unit. So here I don't really have to use like two k's. So I'm just gonna do like a one k, right? And then else if else if but the condition that I'm going to specify is going to be slightly more complicated. So I'm going to do ii test if ii is larger than 1. I'm going to do two conditions. jj equal equal to 20. Then k equals to 5 times ii plus j. 
So here I'm actually using like two different conditions. So one condition is if ii is larger than one, I'm doing the first test ii if, if ii is larger than one. And then the second test is jj, if jj, so if you just use like one equal sign here, it means assignment. I'm putting the variable, the value that's inside of ii to the value, to the variable k. That's an assignment. But if you actually put two equal sign together, that's a comparison. So I'm comparing ii with the number 20. See if the value inside of jj, no, so sorry, it's not ii. See if the value inside of jj is equal to 20 or not. So this is the comparison. The two equal sign concatenating together. So if you are new, if you are a beginner with MATLAB, this is one thing that you have to pay special attention to. You cannot sort of forget like uh, this thing. If you do this thing, it's always going to be true. Basically, because you are assigning 20 to JJ, and MATLAB allows you to return a value from, from, from assignment, and that's going to be true because the assignment is going to happen correctly, right? So if you want to do a comparison, don't forget to use two equal signs, right? Pay special attention to this particular thing. So this is actually a comparison, see if two numbers are equal to each other. And then I'm going to do else, else, k just equals to 1. And then end. That's it. Oh, here I forgot. It's jj, not j, actually. And MATLAB is actually sort of telling me, I if I if I put a J here, MATLAB is actually telling me I might have something wrong here because it's highlighting the it's highlighting the the, the, the the letter. So if you move your cursor here, it's actually telling you what might be the what might be the correct correct way for writing this kind of thing. So it's actually displaying something. For some reason my MATLAB is not sort of sorry. But anyway, I'm gonna fix it to JJ. And then there's another thing that might be wrong here. So it's actually asking me to use two ampersand next to each other. So, so if you use one ampersand, it means end. So the whole thing is going to be the whole condition is going to be true only if this this is true and this is also true. So, so, so. So you can imagine there's also an OR operator. That's going to be the vertical bar. If you type the vertical bar, it's going to be, it means OR, which means that the whole thing is going to be true if one of these conditions is true. Of course, if both conditions are true, the whole thing is also true. But as long as you have one of the conditions is true, the whole condition is true. So that's, that's sort of the meaning of OR. And then and means that if this is true and also this is true, then the whole condition is true. So that's sort of how do we actually combine different conditions together using using either the ampersand or the or. So if you actually put two ampersand together, this is a sh called a short circuit and. A short circuit and can save some calculations. So the result is going to be exactly the same as without the short circuit, just the one ampersand. It's going to be the result is still going to be exactly the same. But this this is going to do this two ampersand together is going to be slightly more efficient because first of all it's going to look at the first condition here. And if the first condition is true, then it's going to look at the second condition. But if the first condition is already false then it's not going to even compute the second condition at all. It's not going to even look at it. So it's not going to do actually this comparison because if the first condition is already false, then the, the whole condition is definitely going to be false because this is an end. And requires both conditions to be true in order for the whole condition to be true. And of course, you also have two vertical bars next to each other. That's a short circuit O. Again, it is uh, some kind of a... Uh, it is some kind of short circuit that saves calculations. So if the first condition is actually false, then it's going to look at the second condition. But if the first condition is true already, it's not going to even look at the second condition at all. It's not going to do any calculation uh, for, for the second condition because because all means that as long as one of the conditions is true, it's, the whole condition is going to be true. So if the first condition is true already, there's no need to do the second to do the second comparison 
to do the second test because uh, it's true already. So the the, the whole condition is going to be true. So so that's a sure circuit all, right? And you can sort of uh, run it, right? Run it, and let's look at what's actually the value of k. K equals to six because uh, i is larger than five, right? So basically, this line actually happens. So you are assigning i i to k. So k also has a value of six, for example, right? Um, so suppose I uh, suppose I change it to like a JJ change it to like twenty, right? But I I still is five six, right? So I I still is larger than five, and the K is this line is still gonna happen, so it's not gonna look at this line. So let's let's give it a try. So in this case, I predict that K is still gonna be six. So let's look at K. K is still gonna be six. The reason is that as soon as this condition is judged to be true, it's going to just uh, run this command and then directly go to the end. It's not going to run this condition. Even though this condition is also true for this particular case, right? 6 is larger than 1, jj equals to 20. So, so this condition is actually true. But it's not going to even look at this condition because this condition is already true and this condition is actually coming uh, before this, this particular condition. So, so it's, um, it's going to execute this command. So, so that's how you can actually use branching structures in in a, in a MATLAB script. So, so branching structure is kind of useful, right? And there's also another thing that's quite useful that's called loops. So loops means that uh, you want to repeat some calculations for a certain amount of time, uh, for for certain iterations, for a certain number of iterations. So let's try to write another script, and uh, let's try to do some kind of a summation. Um, I'm gonna write some comment. I'm gonna do, uh, do uh, we're gonna do one plus one divided by two square, and then plus one divided by three square, then plus plus one divided by ten square. So this this particular sequence actually has an analytic solution. So you can actually do a it's, it's supposed to give you a, a number 1.549768. So you can actually do this kind of calculation analytically and get a get a result. But let's try to use a loop to actually compute this summation, right? So what you can sort of discover from this kind of pattern is that you can change one to one divided by one square, right? So it's basically the denominator actually goes from like 1 to 10 and then square them. So what you can do is to um, so 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 what we are going to do is first we are going to define a variable that's called sum or just to call it s and then we are going to initialize to 0, 0. So I'm going to initialize a variable s. This s is going to hold the summation, the result of the summation. And now I'm gonna sort of do a do a do a loop, do a loop, and the loop structure starts with a keyword called four. So four is again a method keyword, and as soon as you type four, it turns blue. And then you have to introduce what we call a loop index or a iterator. And let's just use ii as the iterator, and ii goes from one to ten. Here I'm using the colon. To represent a range, so ii goes from one to ten with a default stride of one. So ii is going to be one, two, three, four up to ten. So that's that's a for loop with an iterator that's defined as ii, and it has a range that goes from one to ten. And then what I'm going to do is to I'm going to do s equals to s plus one divided by ii square. And then if you want to close the for loop, you do end. And if you want to display the result of the uh, summation, you can do a disp s. That's it. So first let's run it, and I'll, I'll explain it later. So so let's just call the script 5. So it's telling me 1.45498. So it's ha it, has, it has a round it. Has run it, but suppose I change the format to long. 
So format is another MATLAB command that allows you to adjust the number of digits you can see from a certain calculation. So now it's actually sort of displaying more digits. 1.54976. Seven seven. So if you run it, it's a seven six eight. So so it's actually correct. So so now 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 let's get back to to this particular for loop and see what's actually the structure and what exactly is it doing, right? So s started with the value zero. So at the beginning, the s container has the value zero inside of it. And then you started to do this iteration. So every command that's inside of this for n structure. Is going to be repeated, and uh, how many times is this going to be repeated it depends upon this particular range, actually. So, so here I, I goes from one to ten. So it means that this loop, this iteration, is going to be iterated for like ten times. And for the first time it iterates, s has a value of zero. So it's basically zero plus one divided by i i. And for the first iteration. I actually has a value of one, so it's one divided by one square, so it's going to be one. So that's that's this particular number here, and you are adding it to zero, because s has a value of zero. So basically, basically the left hand side of the assignment is just uh, this number, and then you are assigning it back to s. So by the end of the first iteration, s is going to have the value one. Instead of zero, so that's the end of the first loop, and then it's gonna go back to the start of the iteration. That's uh, the, that's this for loop again. That's this for statement, and then this time i i is gonna have a different value. It's gonna take up on the value two. So so the left hand side is s plus one divided by two square. One divided by two square. That's exactly this number. But the s value has changed already after the first equation. The s value has been changed to this number. So basically, on the left-hand side, you are actually computing this number plus this number. So that's the left-hand side, and then you are assigning the left-hand side to the right-hand side. That's s. So by the end of the second equation, s is going to have a value that's equal to this particular summation. A summation of the two first two terms, and then for the third iteration, i i is going to take up on the value of three, and then s is going to have the value on the left hand side. S is going to have the value that's inside this uh, selection, right? And then and then you assign it back to s again. So so by the end of the third iteration, s is going to have the value that's equal to this selection, this selected region, and the whole thing is going to iterate like ten times. So by the end of the the tenth iteration, you are supposed to get this number. So so that's how you can actually use a for loop. The keyword for end the structure with the keyword end. Define a loop index. Uh, define loop index basically specifies how many iterations you want, and then you can just uh, uh, you can just uh, put whatever commands you want to repeat inside this for loop structure. Right, and uh, let's look at some. Uh, some some more examples. For example, let's look at some more examples. Um, now, suppose um, suppose we want to we want to do something do something else. I'm gonna start a new section. Let's start a new new section. So I'm gonna do do a matrix. So I'm gonna assign a variable m equals to seven, n equals to five, and then the a matrix is ones, m rows, n columns. So ones, not one. Ones. So A is gonna be a, a matrix with seven rows, five columns, and a field with ones. And then I'm gonna do a V. V is gonna be a random matrix with one row and columns. So so V is gonna be a random matrix with just one row but n columns. Now I'm gonna do a for loop. So I I goes from one to m. That's my iteration index I I. Goes from one to m, basically the number of rows. The number of rows, and then inside of this body, I'm going to do a i i. The i i s column, uh, the i i s row of the a matrix. I'm taking, I'm taking all the columns. I want all the columns, 
of the IIS rule. And I'm going to change it. Subtract V. So what's going to happen is that the IIS rule of A, so on the left hand side, on the left hand side, it's the IIS rule of the A matrix. The IIS rule of the matrix is going to be a, a vector with just one row and n columns because A is just a, a matrix of m row and n columns. And then I'm subtracting that from uh, with with V. V is a random matrix with one rows and columns. So the dimension actually matches, right? The IIS row of the A matrix is just a one row with n columns. And then V is also one row n columns. So the dimension is exactly the same. And then I'm assigning it back to the IIS row of A. So basically I'm actually modifying the row, the IIS row of the A matrix. And then I put this command inside of the loop. So II actually goes from 1 to M. So let's just run it. So A. So now let's look at the A. Right. So A started with just the ones. And then it's going to subtract V, a random matrix, a random vector with one row and columns. And that that's the result. That's the result. Because the format has been adjusted to long, so it looks like a, a very lots of numbers, right? Let's change the format to short, and then look at A. This is sort of easier to look at, right? So that's another sort of example of the for loop, right? And of course, you can do nested for loop. Let me let me let me let me show you how to sort of uh, suppose suppose. I'm going to do an A matrix at, that equals to uh, zeros, uh, 10 row, 10 columns. If you, you if the number of rows is equal to the number of columns, then you can just uh, sort of use uh, just uh, one input. And now I'm going to do a II goes from 1 to 10. And then JJ equals to 1 to 10 also. So you can sort of see I have typed a one for loop and then Inside of this for loop, I'm writing another for loop, and then I'm gonna do a i i j j equals to i i multiply j j for example. So don't forget, you must have type you must type two n, because this n is for this for in, inner for loop, and this n is for the outer for loop. So, so so that's that's sort of the uh, that's sort of the the nested for loop. Basically, inside of this for loop, you are specifying the value for the ii jj's element, ii's row, jj's column. Basically, you are actually uh, doing this kind of specification. So, if you look at let's let's look at a. So, a is going to be 10 by 10, 10 rows, 10 columns, right? So, the first is the first element is going to be first row, first column is just going to be one multiply one. That's one. The last row, last column, the tenth row, tenth column, is supposed to be 10 multiplied 10. It's going to be 100. And then that's the rest of the uh, matrix. Right? So that's a nested for loop. You can put a smaller for loop inside of a bigger for loop.